So our first speaker of, speaker of the panel is John Walton. Um, John serves as the Chief Information Officer for the City and County of San Francisco. In this role, John oversees the delivery of technology services and citizens, uh, to the citizens of San Francisco and internal support of 23,000 employees. Prior to working for the City of San Francisco, John served as, as the CIO for the City of San Jose and as a Senior Practice Manager for Unisys Government Systems. So please join, join me in welcoming John. Thank you all very much. It's uh, very nice to be here with you today. Is, do I have this thing set up right? Are we OK? Yeah. Everyone hear me all right? Great. So thanks so much for, for having me. I, uh, this is a really interesting topic. As I was, I was thinking about this topic, I, I, I have a number of staff that I usually collaborate with there in my department and across the city talking about this. And I know you heard from Melanie Nutter, our uh, director of the environment yesterday, who's a good friend of mine. And uh, we collaborate on a lot of projects. But I was really struck. Uh, by this conversation, by the topic guy, because it really brought to light for me a couple of things. Uh, really the balance between uh, security and innovation and what we're trying to do. And it's interesting, when I go to conferences now and we talk about smarter cities and innovation and where are we trying to go in the future with technology in cities, there really is this push and pull dynamic happening uh, within government and what we're trying to achieve. And it, it can be a challenge sometimes. And so I just I want to talk about that a little bit today, and uh, then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in what my other panelists have to say, and then interested also in the dialogue at the end and what you're thinking, and uh, some of the questions you might have for us. So let, let me talk a little bit about San Francisco and what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, when, when I go through my slides, it's always fun when I have other people help me on my slides. My chief security officer was in very involved, and my deputy uh, chief Innovation Officer is very involved. But you can always tell when you have a Chief Security Officer help you with a slide because you start getting titles on your slides like Threat Landscape, which is pure, <laughs> pure Security Officer speak for she's not happy uh, with how she sees things going in terms of security in the city. But it is true. It is true that we're seeing a, a, a very large increase over the past few years in a really much more organized uh, security attempts on the city network. And uh, San Francisco, because of our geographic location, because of some of the uh, political and uh, perhaps uh, unpopular views uh, people see of San Francisco, we, we do become a target at times, right? A popular target for people trying to make a point, uh, much like a Microsoft or something like that. If you can hack San Francisco, you're definitely going to get your name in the newspaper. And so we've seen a real uptick in terms of uh, cyber incidents, cyber threats against our network. And, and you have to remember, our city, much like many of your cities, are a very large one in, in terms of complexity. We have our own utility commission that we operate with uh, power and water. Uh, we have our own transportation authority that does light rail and buses. We have our own airport that we manage. And so along with the typical city things you see, we have a very, uh, very diverse, very complex IT infrastructure we have to manage. And we're a very diverse organization. We, uh, we're not organized in a very top-down uh, corporate model by any means. Uh, much more, as I was telling a group outside, a much more parliamentary model where some people are appointed and some people are independently elected. And so it takes a real team approach to try to come up with ways to secure this network. And so uh, along with this increase, I'm, I'm happy to say, is uh, we've become much more successful, uh, knock on wood, uh, uh, defending against these types of attacks. And, and I think we've become much more organized. And, and perhaps we've learned something from the innovation journey. We, we're not taking the classic IT top-down approach of trying to be extremely uh, directive to departments about how to do things, but we're becoming much more collaborative. We're really trying to leverage the knowledge of the entire organization and the skill sets we see in each department to try to come up with a much more uh, sort of agile uh, team approach to how we protect the network. And I'm, I'm very proud of the, the staff in the city that, that manage this. Uh, on the other hand, um, we, uh, we're trying to balance this against innovation. And some of the things we're trying to, to balance is uh, the, the security, uh, with all due respect to my security team, uh, they would love everything to be dual-level authentication, everything encrypted, everything locked down in a data center, only giving access to uh, those people who 
uh, past uh, extensive FBI background test access to anything in terms of our network for data. Uh, on the other hand, I have an innovation group, and we're all about breaking down the walls of government, making government more open, more transparent, more accessible. How do we give people more access to the data? Because one of the things we've learned in, in our government is, for us at least, a smart city uh, isn't just the instrumentation in the streets and how much technology we have embedded in our city, uh, but really the people in our city are some of the best instrumentation, I guess, if you will, uh, that we have in our city. We have a very engaged population, a very high-tech population in San Francisco. You've probably heard how many companies are now moving into San Francisco, and so uh, everyone on the street has a tablet or a smartphone, and they want to be very engaged with government, and not just engaged in a civic sense, but uh, in the old days, you know, we would ask people to, to come and to uh, pick up trash or help us remove graffiti and things like that, what we found in the past few years is that actually we get more volunteers to come help us write programs and things. So along with the fact that uh, we've gone through some significant budget reductions in the city, what we've done by breaking down sort of those traditional walls in government is try to allow the population, these, these civic uh, entrepreneurial uh, volunteers to come in and really help us create uh, better applications, better tools for the public to interact with government. And some, one of the examples of this is we have a program, and I'm, I, I, I'm always amazed at how successful this program has been for us. And, and around the nation, uh, actually, if you look at what Chicago and Boston and New York and the feds are doing now uh, with open data, but really in, in, the, in the old model of government, in the secure, if you will, uh, mindset of government, what we would have done is taken all of our data, encrypted it, put it on servers, made sure it was backed up and stored somewhere. No one had access to it unless you were a government employee. And if you, the public, wanted access to it, we would print you out a hard copy or we'd give you a report with some of the data you wanted in it. But the, the idea around open data in government is we've spent a lot of time over the past few years trying to really classify our data. We have, as you would suspect in government, thousands and thousands of sets of data. Some of it um, very complex, very information rich data, some of it very simple data. But we had never really gone through a discipline process of really understanding the data we had and trying to balance uh, providing that data in a online usable format to our users where they could write their own applications, where they could do their own data analytics around it versus us doing that for them. So we spent a lot of time on that now actually. And by releasing the data, what has happened is it's allowing the public, it's allowing companies or individuals or volunteer groups to come in and write applications or do analytics around our data, huge data sets and small data sets, really do data mashups and help create applications that are making government better for people without, uh, I should say, compromising the integrity of really the, the systems behind the scenes. And so, uh, there was a lot of uh, talk uh, as we were going through this over the past few years about, you know, uh, things as simple as, you know, why can't I find out when the bus is going to show up on time? Why can't I find a parking place in San Francisco? Uh, why can't I find, in, in this case, where sex crimes are happening or what the crime rates are in my neighborhood? And all that data in the past was considered very sensitive data because it contained personal information. And so a lot of what my security team does now is work with my innovation team and really try to help understand the structure and the, and the sensitivity of the data, not just restricting access to the data. So we try to take the data sets now, and we don't try to pre-presume what people would use them for, because one of the things we've learned is uh, we're not the best experts on what innovative folks such as yourselves might want to use the data for, but really take some of the, the the sensitive personal information about it. If I have data with the city and it has my home address or my cell phone number or my social security number, we make sure we go through a very exhaustive process of stripping out the sensitivity of the personal information, but still providing a rich enough data set uh, to the public so that then they can take that and turn it into a really uh, useful application or tool. And, and through releasing the data, uh, we, we've created over 100 applications that didn't cost government anything, are very useful, anything as simple as, you know, finding a place to park in the city now. We have applications for that without compromising our transportation systems. But we're trying to create that bridge between innovation. How do we 
how do we create the smarter city? How do we create these applications you can run on your smartphones or on your tablets and have access to things that in the past government has had a real challenge in providing to the public without compromising the actual integrity of the backend systems behind it. And so we're spending a lot more time on, on the data model, frankly. We, we feel the data is the building blocks to a lot of innovation here in the city. And we want to make sure that the data is as available as possible to the public. Another thing that went along with this is uh, one of the inhibitors we found in the past is, uh, like many governments, we have an aging infrastructure, uh, many, many old systems that store data in very proprietary formats and things like that. And we were spending a lot of time, uh, frankly, doing data conversion or, or wondering how we were going to make these systems accessible to the public because we have old mainframe systems and, and, and many old proprietary systems that we bought over the years that we haven't had uh, a chance to modernize yet. And so uh, one of the, the, the decisions we made when we, became, when we began this uh, journey of both securing and, and releasing data was really looking at the cloud. And for us, what the cloud means is really balancing between what systems should we own and operate and control internally versus where should we partner uh, with perhaps external vendors and find an external vendor that had already has a proven solution, not just a proven solution, but a secure and accessible solution. So we, we spend a lot of time now when we're buying new systems or converting old systems, uh, we have a policy that we've passed that's really changed our approach on this where we call it our cloud first policy where we require that any department or, or any user that wants to implement a, a new large system that we think could have some data or a, a benefit to the public, really consider a, a cloud, a, a vendor provided a SaaS or a, or a uh, infrastructure as a service or a, a software as a service type model, and really uh, take into careful consideration, does this need to be an internally hosted, managed lockdown system? Or is it possible we could find a very secure system that we, uh, that we could both con uh, conduct the city business on securely but allow access to? And, and I'll point you to, we have an open 311 API. This is probably a good example of a success in this area where we actually collaborated with a lot of other large cities and jointly created an API that allows citizens, and if you go to the San Francisco, uh, City of San Francisco Facebook page, there's actually applications now where you get direct access into our CRM system where you can report problems, where you can report potholes and things like that. And so by collaborating uh, with the private sector and really examining how we do business, rather than doing the old model where we would write the application, you go to a web page, we're leveraging public cloud technology and really trying to figure out how we could integrate that with our backend system securely to create a more usable system. So I want to leave enough time for the other presenters. I know I went through that quickly, but I know there will be a lot, of, uh, a lot of dialogue at the end. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to the conversation. Our next speaker is Pascal Sipon. He's an international cybersecurity project manager, manager at EDF, and he's currently serving as a resident researcher at EPRI in Palo Alto. His main duty is to lead the collaboration between EDF and EPRI on, cybersecurity, uh, on smart grid cybersecurity projects. Prior to this appointment, Pascal joined EDF R&D and focused on industrial control system cybersecurity um, for, diff for different EDF critical infrastructure businesses, so he's well-versed in that area. And very much looking forward to hearing him speak. Please join me welcome Pascal. Thank you very much, much Ravi. Um, good morning, everyone. So um, basically, what I'd like to, uh, to talk very briefly this morning is to introduce uh, the cybersecurity uh, aspect um, from an operator perspective. And uh, so I'd like first to, to start with uh, positioning what is smart and uh, what are the, the real meaning uh, that's behind some of the words 
uh, because when we talk about smart, uh, we think is that everything is positive, but smart uh, to be to be um, uh, just um, not not emotional world uh, will be to say that the devices that are smart are able to communicate, so to input or output information that are able to process data, process information, and finally those devices are able to act uh, on a physical layer. And that's why usually we call those systems cyber physical systems, uh, because we can dissociate their physical features and their uh, uh, cyber um, features or uh, interfaces. So uh, what we can ask ourselves um, is for example, uh, is it, is it uh, very interesting to uh, optimize public transportation? Probably yes. Uh, is it in uh, interesting to have uh, smart appliances for uh, traffic lights? Yes, but there are maybe some drawbacks if uh, someone is able to control the system. Uh, is it the same case for critical infrastructures as water treatment, for example? So the answer could be more complex depending on the level of criticity of the infrastructure you're considering. Uh, so back to, uh, to the topic of my presentation. Uh, I just have three slides, so it will be uh, quick. Uh, the first one is uh, to give an overview of the operator's perspective. The a utility like, uh, like EDF uh, missions, overall missions, is mainly to ensure safety of operation safety for people, but also safety for, uh, compared to the environment, and safety, uh, safety for equipment also. And uh, second uh, mission is to manage the reliability of the electric system uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective, and of course to maintain the economic performance and uh, efficiency. So what is the real role of cybersecurity inside these missions? The role of cybersecurity is just to support those missions. Cybersecurity itself is not a mission or is not a, a goal. Uh, Cybersecurity just contributes to, to those missions. Uh, some priorities from an operator perspective uh, are first in interdependencies. Uh, it's really the case uh, considering uh, smart cities, we have lots of different infrastructures, but also lots of different uh, players uh, like citizens, and uh, we have uh, uh, public forces, for example, emergency uh, systems, and so on. So there could be some interdependencies between uh, each of those players, and we have to uh, uh, to take very care of the inter possible interdependencies. Second point is uh, the uh, necessity to uh, to deal with the legacy systems. We have lots of legacy system, of course, in the electric power industry because when we install some equipment, it could uh, stay for more than 10 years, sometimes more than 20 or 30 years. Uh, so we have to uh, take advantage of the legacy system and, and design systems from the beginning to be reliable and to be resilient, so to be able to support um, attacks, failures, and errors. And there is an, an example here uh, coming from the uh, electric power systems. We, we, are, uh, we are used, in fact, um, to, uh, to use circuit breakers and to reconfigure top, the electric, uh, electrical topology when there are some failures on the electric network. And uh, so we are able to isolate uh, zones that, uh, that are uh, errors and to limit propagation of failures or attacks. And so that's uh, a little bit what we, what we are trying to uh, also use on the IT, uh, IT level. Um, so I, I wanted also to speak a little bit about the business driver of cybersecurity because that's uh, of course a very important question. Uh, the first, uh, first element of uh, of discussion uh, considering business driver is that if you compare the cost of uh, integrating security during the requirements phase uh, compared to uh, integrating security after deployment, so in the field, after everything has been already deployed, usually uh, there is uh, a factor from one to 100 uh, coming from a publication from uh, BOM 
on the IEEE uh, uh, paper. And usually that's what also we, uh, we see coming from the field. That's the kind of the figures that we have to keep in mind. And uh, that also reminds us that even if at the time uh, when we design a system, we don't really see uh, what is the level of security that we, we need to, uh, to introduce from the start, we have to make sure that uh, the final system will be able to upgrade his level of security. A second point which is very important in cybersecurity, cybersecurity finally is just risk management, uh, which means that if there is no real use case, no business case, uh, then there is no need for cybersecurity. Uh, for example, if we are just uh, processing public information um, and just to uh, do something that we can very uh, easily verify or check with a different source, so we don't really need uh, availability, maybe we don't need integrity of the information, then we don't need confidentiality also because it's public information, then there is no specific needs for cybersecurity. Well, it's not, uh, it's not usually the case uh, from a critical infrastructure operator point of view, but it could be the case for, for some of the smart cities applications. Uh, the second point, uh, considering uh, risk management, is to spend, uh, spend resources, limited resources, on critical functions. And that's what this picture uh, illustrates. So this is a picture from the SIGRES, from the, uh, the Big Electric Network uh, Association Council. And uh, in this picture, you, you, you see in, in, uh, uh, in the red uh, circle here, it's uh, talking about the critical systems, and then you have business critical, and then you have uh, other layers, like corporate and, and let's say external, uh, external layers. So what we need to focus on, of course, it's on critical system, and we need to make sure that other system will not uh, be able to interfere with the critical operations. So my, um, to conclude a little bit my, uh, my talk, I'd like, uh, I'd like to speak about the collaboration. For us, collaboration is key. Uh, we don't have resources to handle and to manage all the cybersecurity issues by yourself. So cybersecurity uh, is, uh, collaboration is very important. And uh, uh, of course, in the US, they are, uh, the US are more advanced, uh, generally speaking, on the cybersecurity aspects. For example, on the regulation side, there is uh, the uh, NERC SIP, uh, which is the North American um, Electric uh, Reliability uh, Council, and they have published um, a reliability standards talking about critical infrastructure protection <coughs> and including some cybersecurity aspects. Um, and uh, yes, also here in the Silicon Valley, it's, it's even more interesting to uh, collaborate with uh, IT companies and IT talents, and uh, but on the Europe also it has uh, it has become a, a real priority to uh, defend our systems. For example, there are uh, directives from the European uh, Commission that have been declined into uh, national policies, and uh, also on the European Commission level there are some mandates uh, around smart whatever, smart cities, smart meters, smart, uh, uh, smart grid, and so on. And in those uh, mandates, it uh, it's always includes a specific working group on cybersecurity. And um, <laughs> we have also, um, uh, okay, the European Agency, uh, the framework uh, project, research project, collaborative research project we already um, talked about um, this morning and yesterday. And uh, finally, on the international collaboration, we basically have uh, some very well-known groups here. And what I wanted also to, to highlight is uh, we have a strong collaboration with uh, EPRI, so Galen will speak just uh, after me. And uh, we think that collaboration is key. Uh, collaboration needs uh, two legs to, to work very well. Uh, the first is trust, of course, and the second is commitment. Uh, commitment to bring value uh, to, to the collaboration, and that's what we what we try to do together with EPRI. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to talk maybe. For the
our, our next speaker is um, Galen Rashi. He's a technical executive in the power delivery and utilization sector at the Electric Power Research Institute and the program manager for the PDU Cybersecurity and Privacy Program. Prior to joining EPRI, Galen led the Embedded and Applications Security Group at Southwest Research Institute, where he was the project manager for, mul for multiple advanced meter and infrastructure pen penetration testing uh, projects and was also the cybersecurity lead for the Center for the Commercialization of Electric Technologies Department of Energy demonstration project, which focused on the deployment of synchrophaser technology, the smart meter Texas portal, distributed generation, home area networks, and the direct load control. Please join me in welcoming Galen. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, all of the panel sessions and speakers we've had the opportunity to listen to uh, yesterday and today. And this is the last, the last panel, so hopefully everybody's still awake and has their energy level up and got a lot of uh, coffee during the break earlier. Uh, so I'll keep, keep my comments brief. I know uh, we want to save enough time for the uh, Q&A uh, session a little bit later, so I'll keep it as short as Pascal did. And hopefully I'll also be able to add something new to the conversation as well. It's one of the disadvantages of going uh, toward the last uh, spot there is that uh, a lot of things have already been said. So then again, maybe repetition will help you remember it as well. So, all right, so I wanted to uh, start with looking at what are the different um, threats to smart cities. And as Larry mentioned, uh, I've worked with various smart grid projects. And when you look at the types of technologies that are deployed in terms of having potentially millions of devices put out into the field, a variety of communications technologies and automated systems, you know, there's a lot of parallels you can draw between smart grid systems that are already being deployed and uh, systems that would be deployed for, uh, to, to support smart cities. And uh, it's very common uh, when you talk about cybersecurity, especially in this type of domain with critical infrastructure, to talk about looking at security from the holistic perspective. And you say, well, what does that, what does that mean? It, well, part of it is understanding what all of the different threats are uh, to smart cities. And we've already touched on a few of these today. Uh, so, you know, if you can basically categorize them into these three, these three categories. You know, first are deliberate attacks. And so when, uh, when Arshad Mansour talked yesterday morning, he mentioned some of the, the types of attacks we're seeing from nation states now and, and hacktivists. We also have hobbyists that, that will uh, go out and uh, play, with, play with systems as well, just because they can. Or sometimes they just want to make a name for themselves as well. But in addition to that, it's very important to also consider the inadvertent threats. And so a lot of times this can be related to user error. Uh, for example, you could have an operator that comes into the office Monday morning, they're very tired, maybe they had a really good time over the weekend, not quite thinking clearly and can uh, hit the wrong commands or push wrong buttons or do other, other things that can uh, disrupt the system. So in addition to looking at how deliberate attacks can impact the system, you also make sure you have the right controls in place so that inadvertent threats uh, can, be, uh, can be dealt with as well. Um, then, of course, we also have natural phenomena that can disrupt, uh, disrupt your system and, and be a threat to, uh, to a smart city. And unfortunately, we've seen quite an example of that over the last week here in the, in the northeast part of the U.S. with the hurricane. But that can also cover things like tornadoes and earthquakes as well. So, uh, so when you think about the idea of having a resilient, smart city, you have to look at all of these different, different threats uh, that could disrupt the, um, the services in the city. So there's several trends uh, that can, uh, technology trends that can impact security. And we, we are seeing this on the next, on next generation grid devices. And like I said, a lot of these can be carried over to any new system that will be deployed on, as part of a critical infrastructure. You know, so you're going to have increasing your connections at all levels. Uh, so you'll have devices talking to devices. You have devices talking to control systems. You can have data that's being pushed into back-end enterprise systems, you know, just as part of managing your, managing your systems. In addition to that, you might want to be able to get that data out to users as well. So it could be a user gets data directly from a device like a smart meter, or they get it, they go onto the website to do things like look at their energy consumption or look at where the 
I, you know, where the pollution is bad in the city for that, uh, for that day, for example. So there's, uh, but, but to make that happen, you have to have uh, highly interconnected, interconnected systems. And with that, you can also run the risk of having insecure connections as well. And that's especially if you're having to incorporate legacy devices and legacy systems into that, into that overall system. Um, I think another risk that we've seen uh, with, uh, with some of the smart grid technology is this reliance on um, external communications. And by that, I'm primarily uh, focusing on the use of cellular technology as part of these control systems. And uh, there's a lot of good reasons for using cellular technology. It reduces the number of wires and cables that you're running to all these devices. But at the same time, that's a shared public resource as well. So if you're using that as part of a control system where you have different uh, latency requirements, things that you care about, you might have a, a service level agreement, but at the same time, when there is a big problem or, a, or something that causes a large disruption, sometimes those agreements uh, can, get, can get tossed out. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind as you're, as you're looking at those technology solutions. Um, also, you have increased capability of, of field equipment. So more intelligent electronic devices uh, that are deployed out in, out in the field. And so they'll actually be using the data that they're collecting from sensors, maybe as part of a field area network, to make their own decisions uh, about how to react to the changing environment, which leads to the last bullet, this increasing levels of automation. And uh, for things, uh, for different activities that you want to have happen in real time, you know, it's, it, and it's going to be very key to have this automation, to have the right level of efficiency and, and operations for the system. But when you have that level of automation, that also means it can become more difficult to predict how the system reacts when there's a problem. Uh, that automated system can be interconnected with another automated system, you know, for example, so you can have some cascading effects from that as well. So, so these are just, just trends, and I don't want to necessarily say that each of these is introducing a vulnerability. I would, I would rather say that they're increasing the attack surface for a system, which is not the same thing as saying that you're in introducing vulnerabilities. Just more ways that people can touch a system and attack a system. So in addition uh, to, to this overall threat landscape and these technology trends, there's been a significant increase in the attention that's being, uh, being given to infrastructure security, uh, both from the government side, but also, at, and, and from the fuel deployment system, but also from uh, malicious actors as well. And so, uh, as I mentioned, Arshad discussed some of these nation state activities um, yesterday. And it used to be that when you talked about a nation state threat, you were usually talking about a very large country in Asia that was primarily interested in things like intellectual property uh, uh, theft, or um, we're learning more about military systems, and, and which also gave rise to the term of the advanced persistent threat as well. But there's really one very large source uh, of those of those attacks. Um, now, however, you you've had over the last two years, you had the release of Stuxnet, which was really an incredible game changer. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, you know, please please look that up. I think about a third of you have your laptops open right now, so you can probably Google it. <laughs> um, but uh, then after Stuxnet came Flame, which is another very, very sophisticated piece of malware uh, that was deployed and tar targeted very specific um, uh, countries and systems as well. Uh, but then when you do that and people become aware of those activities, uh, a lot of times those nations will react to that. And so there's actually an article just yesterday um, on CNN uh, that was talking about um, the uh, cyber threats coming from Iran. So maybe there's a lot of attention being paid to the potential for uh, or on their development of a nuclear nuclear weapon. But uh, there's a lot of suspicion that Iran is behind some massive attacks on U.S. bank websites over the last few weeks, as well as the um, Aramco attack. So now you're starting to see this landscape become more complex and that it's not just a single actor that you're concerned about getting trade secrets or military technology. Now we are seeing this become more of a geopolitical 
game and, and tool. And uh, to, to think that smart cities would be somehow be immune from that, I, I think is uh, probably not, not very realistic. So also we have new exploit tools. So who here is familiar with Metasploit? Anybody? One. All right. That, maybe, maybe a few more. Well, that's something else you can Google. <laughs> so it's, it's really an incredible tool um, uh, uh, that's used for security testing, and it's an extensible tool. And so when you find vulnerabilities, people can write exploit modules for that and put it into Metasploit. And so in addition to your regular computer uh, exploits, you're seeing more exploits that are targeted towards control system software as well. So that makes it very easy for people to use that tool to attack uh, control systems that are out there. And then there are other more one-off tools as well that are being developed and released. Um, then this has also been a hot topic at security conferences lately. Uh, so I put a picture of the meter here because I'm sure John is aware of this, that one of the talks at, at Black Hat in 2009 focused on hacking the new smart meters in the city of San Francisco. And so they demonstrated how, how they did that. It didn't take them very long to do that. And, uh, but the, the point is that when you deploy these new technologies and systems out, out in the field, you will have people looking at them. They will look at ways to gain the system, especially if they involve money and having to pay for things. So, uh, so you can count on those devices being either physically hacked uh, or, or attacked in, in other ways. Uh, but just in general, you know, lots of talks out there on doing things like war driving the smart grid or exploiting control systems. And so there's a lot of information that's available on how, on how to do this. So, uh, so when you think about all these threats and the different threat actors and uh, the potential risk with, with uh, deploying uh, technology to support smart cities or to support <laughs> smart grid, can be a little bit overwhelming uh, at times. So uh, when you go about designing systems you know, to, be, to be more secure, uh, there's still a very straightforward flow, design flow that you, that you can follow to, uh, to do that. And um, the biggest and most important part of this is this risk assessment. And I, I think it's been mentioned several times already that you can't make a you can't make this system entirely secure. So instead you want to look at your risks. You know, what are the, what are the different ways the system can be attacked, where it can be vulnerable, uh, which risks are you willing to accept, which ones are you going to try to mitigate and spend money on security uh, controls to mitigate. But that is absolutely the key part of it. It's not how to protect the system, it's how you want to manage your risk. And then once you have that settled out, it becomes very straightforward to develop your high-level security requirements and develop the security architecture once you've done, done that initial risk assessment and decided where you want to, uh, to work to protect the system. And by the way, this was in, um, this flow came from this NIST interagency uh, report, uh, which is a 762A report, Guidelines for Smart Grid Cybersecurity. It's a very good resource if you want to understand um, requirements for, uh, for the smart grid. And it includes, of course, a privacy assessment as well. So it's not just about protecting confidentiality of data, but also looking at privacy issues associated with that. So that's what you're doing is system design. Then once you design and deploy, or once you design the system, then you have to deploy it. And when you deploy it, uh, this, is the, this is the general cycle um, that, that is traditionally used for IT security. You know, first you try to protect the system. Next, if you are under attack or you've had a breach, you need to be able to detect that that has happened, so you have to have the right technology to detect that. Uh, next, you have to be able to respond to that incident. So you have to have your incident response plan. You have to know what actions you want to take um, when you respond to that. And then finally, you need to recover from that. So that is usually where you would go take a system that's been infected, take it back, try to wipe it, uh, you know, bring the system back up. And uh, one of the one of the key differences between doing IT security and security for infrastructure is, once again, this need to design for resiliency. So you assume the incidents will happen, you design the system uh, to be able to manage those incidents, but 
this idea of being able to maintain uh, system services and uh, have a survivable system, I think, is certainly one of the key uh, differentiators between a regular IT system and an infrastructure system like a smart grid or a smart uh, or a smart city. And because uh, you can't just go unplug a system. You know, if you have a system that's expected to run 24/7, it's a real-time control system. It's not like when someone shows up in your office to tell you that they think your computer's infected and they're going to unplug it and take it and walk away. Uh, you can't do that on these systems. So you need to make sure that you have um, the right uh, playbooks uh, to be able to react to incidents and to try to maintain some minimal level of service as you are managing the incidents and responding to them and recovering from them. So uh, if there are two, two key takeaways that I hope you'll, you'll uh, take from this today, and the, one of them is that, uh, as mentioned, um, cybersecurity is really about risk management. Uh, and that always needs to be the framework that you approach the problem of cybersecurity with. And second is the need uh, to support resiliency and survivability uh, in, in these new systems. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gavin. Um, I, what I'd like to do is talk for a few minutes um, on a topic we've heard a lot about security issues related to smart grid, sort of the vision for smart grid and some of the enabling technologies. I'd like to um, speak a little bit about a complementary topic, which is privacy. And um, I think it, in one aspect, we can think of privacy as a risk in this, um, but also as, a, as something that we need to consider when making some of these um, smart city technologies cyber secure. So, what I'd like to do um, to start out with to kind of motivate the discussion is talk a little bit about um, examples of past technologies, not necessarily related to uh, smart city, but new technologies that came out that had privacy issues um, related with them when they were deployed. So um, for some of you uh, older Facebook users, you might remember back in 2007, Facebook released this Beacon uh, uh, application. And this was something that linked Facebook to some of their partner websites um, uh, like Travelocity and eBay and so forth. And whenever you made a purchase there, this would show up on your uh, Facebook newsfeed. Um, seemed interesting enough and something that, in, you know, in a sharing environment, a lot of Facebook users would like to have available to them, but it, um, it was not very well received by the Facebook community and the uh, public in, in general for a number of privacy um, issues. Um, not the least of which it was ena enabled as something you had to opt out of. So it was turned on by default and then the user had to actively go in to turn this off. So um, uh, Facebook very quickly backpedaled and disabled that service. Um, a little more recently in the telecommunications space, um, a number of handset manufacturers and uh, telecom providers were, um, came under fire for the deployment of a, an application by, uh, developed by Carrier IQ that collected information off of your handset, including um, its location, uh, text messages, websites you visited, even uh, keystrokes. Uh, supposedly, and, um, and sent those back to the carrier, uh, oftentimes without much security and sometimes um, in violation of privacy policies and, and even laws that, were, um, that protected some of that information. Um, we're all familiar with um, going online and seeing advertising when we check our email and chat and so forth. Um, unbeknownst to a lot of us is there's, there are an awful lot of processes that go on behind there to serve up those ads to you. Um, most of which are driven by tracking the activity that you, um, that you take when you go online. And so there are a number of technologies, Trust has investigated this and, and um, others as well, and this has led to an, um, what's called this Do Not Track initiative, and we're sort of in the process of working with some of these industry organizations, web browser vendors, um, and um, uh, other technology companies to come up with a more privacy-preserving um, method of allowing you to um, go online and do activity um, and, and still have ad advertising provided to you uh, as a service, but without revealing very much information about what you do. Um, and a little more close to and relevant to the topic of this uh, workshop, um, 
our smart meters, which are, we, you know, we all know are a key component of advanced metering infrastructure and some of the next generation um, uh, technology that's being deployed. Uh, here in California, as elsewhere, there are a number of um, concerns around the security of the devices, um, consumers, advocacy groups, uh, researchers all identified some security problems with the devices themselves and also issues around protecting the data, the energy usage data that was collected from them. So um, all the, this is not an exhaustive list, but just an example, but uh, y y there's some common themes across all of these. Um, one of which is that, that each of these technologies was intended to be, provide sort of enhanced services or new features to the user. Um, but when they were deployed, there was very quickly some backlash and some negative reaction by those who used them. Um, this not only caused the, the companies to kind of scramble to have to backpedal or make changes to their systems, but there was also a lot of public relations work that they had to do and so forth, a lot of saving face to, to help the public understand what they were trying to do. Um, and then all of these systems and uh, technologies have, have been modified, either the technologies themselves or the, the operational processes around them, or in some cases, like with Beacon, they were completely uh, disabled altogether. Um, so when we, when we talk about um, uh, Smart City, um, I didn't bring those up to sort of rehash some missteps in the past, but what I wanted to do was kind of have it inform the discussion around how we think about privacy when we are looking at um, and sort of thinking about the enabling technologies that are required for um, a, a smart city and smart infrastructure. So we've heard um, kind of various um, opinions about w what a smart city entails. And sort of notionally, these are some things that um, would be provided, more efficient operations and access to services, improved quality of life, life for citizens within a, a, um, a city, reduced carbon footprint and other impacts to the environment, um, as well as a, a, an expectation of a more adaptive um, infrastructure that will support these new services, and also resilience, uh, something that's more secure and more stable and, and able to withstand various types of um, faults, failures, or attacks, as we've you know, sort of heard earlier. Um, in order to achieve this, however, there are a number of, of capabilities and technologies that need to be um, put in place. And each of these, this is, again, it's not an exhaustive list, but a few examples of some things that bring along with them some unique privacy um, issues or considerations when they're being deployed. So one aspect is this increased interconnection and automation, and Galen talked a little bit about this, and we heard other speakers mention this as well. So in order to provide some of these services, there's going to be more connectivity, more automation within the infrastructure. Um, along with that, um, more, I won't call it ubiquitous, but more sensing, more monitoring, um, potentially more actuation, sort of more, more devices in the, in, the, um, in the environment, sort of this, what's in the past been kind of thought of as this embedded everywhere or Internet of Things, sort of the next generation of that where everything will be instrumented, a lot of information will be collected. Um, and this increased data will grow exponentially, and along with that will be the need for some sophisticated tools and other technologies to do uh, more robust analytics and be able to really mine this, the large amount of data that's being collected to um, come up with some meaningful information and, and something that's useful to not only the infrastructure operators but the end users as well, the citizens, the municipalities and so forth. Um, and enabling a lot of this is the, the, um, the ICT the, and network control systems and some of the um, management and operational systems that will sit on top of it as well. So all of these uh, introduce um, kind of unique privacy issues uh, th with them as they're being deployed, as they're being used, as people interact with the, um, with the technologies. So how do we ensure that privacy is addressed in a smart city? And I was, I was pleased to hear some of the comments I'll, I'll mention here in a second um, brought up earlier, but um, a few examples are, um, are shown here, and again, it's not meant to be exhaustive, but I think these are some, some points that should be taken into consideration, especially as we're thinking about designing, de um, uh, designing, developing, and deploying some of these technologies. So first, privacy policies and requirements, um, much like security, need to be aligned and part of the discussion from the beginning with broader objectives for the technology or the application and, and make sure that the privacy side is, is considered along with some of the other uh, drivers of the technology. Um, second, solutions should address not just technology but also people and policy. So this holistic approach is beneficial when considering deploying any solution, but in, in this context, there's a real emphasis on the privacy aspect of it um, and how it relates to the technology, to standards, laws, and so forth. Um, 
Finally, as was illustrated from the examples earlier, privacy is a vital prerequisite for consumer adoption of any technology. Um, putting privacy at or near the center of the design and the deployment decisions will help, and I was, I was pleased to see Don emphasize that, and I think it came up in an earlier discussion as well. Um, likewise, understanding the trade-offs people made, make when it comes to privacy is a real key. So, you know, today all of us give up a certain amount of privacy uh, to get something in return, whether it's swipe, swiping our club card at Safeway or purchasing something on Amazon or deploying, um, as we heard about yesterday, deploying a smart, an intelligent thermostat like, like Nest. Um, there's a certain amount of privacy that we give up, but if the utility uh, is greater than that, we're usually okay with it. Um, along with that, while we've got an expectation of our, that our personal information is protected, each person's idea of privacy is different, thus there's a need to deeply understand this notion of privacy and how it can impact consumer adoption, especially as we're thinking about some of these enabling technologies that were, will allow this smart city concept. Um, the, the privacy aspects of it really need to be considered and some of this consumer sentiment, social norms, um, and since we're sort of talking about this uh, US-EU forum as well, differences between privacy perceptions and notions of privacy here in the US are very different from Europe, they're very different from Asia and so forth. So as we're talking about solutions that can be deployed globally, we need to consider um, how they will be perceived in the various target uh, markets. So with that, thank you very much. And um, uh, we'll have time for questions uh, afterwards. I think if I could, um, do we have, are we okay on time? Okay, great. So if I could ask um, John, Galen, Pascal to come on up. And so as they're getting settled, I know that the, the previous session, as I mentioned earlier, talked a little bit about security and privacy. So. Um, you know, we, we've got plenty of time for questions here. What I'd like to do is, um, based on the, the topics that they all discussed earlier, ask a couple of questions to get the discussion started. Um, but, but then we'll certainly open it up and we'll have microphones that we can pass around as well. Um, so thank you all again very much for speaking. It was, it was really interesting. Um, you all sort of touched on different aspects of it. And I think um, one thing I like about this panel is we're sort of bringing in different perspectives to the security problem. So um, John, maybe if I could start with you. Uh, there was. Something you, you'd mentioned about within the, the city and county of San Francisco, you sort of have adopted this team approach and sort of this, that, that, that model and operating in, in city government. Um, and not so much, especially from a security perspective, have taken this top down and sort of mandating things, but sort of working collaboratively. So I'm wondering if you could, if you could share a little bit about um, how that's worked, specifically in the security space. I can see how that could work with another, a number of other agencies across the government but how that's been beneficial in terms of addressing a, a number of the threats that you, your city faces every day and, some, and implementing some of the solutions um, uh, from a security standpoint. Sure, well, uh, like I said, San Francisco is, is probably not unique, but it's a challenge in the sense that you have a lot of highly independent, uh, independently run and independently operated organizations. And so, uh, to, to be the chief information officer or the director of the central IT department and try to dictate uh, policies or procedures or standards everyone's going to follow is, uh, is probably not the most effective way to achieve a cohesive approach to security. And so uh, some of the examples brought up about the parking meters being hacked, there's, I can give you plenty of other examples. Uh, we had a server taken over at the PUC by a Chinese gaming company uh, for uh, <laughs> gaming purposes, luckily. Uh, so, uh, I found out about that one because I got a letter in the mail one day saying, by the way, your personal information might have been exposed. <laughs> a fun way for me to find out that our PUC had actually uh, had, a, had a penetration event. But um, I think, you know, that the, the, the change in really the culture, and I, I will say this about cybersecurity and open government, is it's, it's certainly a technological problem that we all face, and, you know, hearing about all the examples of how the the attacks and threats are becoming more uh, uh, sophisticated, at the same time easier to launch, perhaps with toolkits online and things like that. It, it's certainly sobering. 
On the other hand, I think uh, for us in San Francisco, the change has really been really changing how we address them. It can't be a sort of top-down dictatorial approach to how we're going to achieve these things. First of all, I think we're having to accept that there's going to be some amount of um, events that happen that get through our defenses. And so first is to get past that sort of cultural internal barrier of sharing with each other when we have problems and, and being open about what those problems are, either from a security uh, event or confidentiality breach, learning from that, and then uh, really come up with a team approach to doing it. We all have very small staffs. Uh, none of us have uh, probably as large uh, uh, IT budget in terms of security or staffing that we'd like in each of our individual departments in, the, in government. So what we had to do is we've reached out to the FBI over in Oakland, and we, we developed a relationship with them. We started meeting uh, a lot of the private industry uh, companies that have uh, better, frankly, security uh, models than we do. And, and having very open uh, sort of collaborative meetings internal to the city and, and created these uh, response teams and search teams when we have a problem, we go in and we look at it and we're very collaborative about do we understand what happened, how are we going to prevent that from happening in other places in the cities, and really trying to take that on because um, I think that's really part of the cultural change in government is we were always afraid to fail before. And we don't want to fail, but it, it's, it's a reality that sometimes with technology in a very diverse, uh, non-homogeneous ecosystem, you're going to have failures, you're going to have penetrations. And so how do, you, how do you learn from that, and how do you change the culture of the organization so that every failure becomes uh, something you can learn from and make the system stronger from in the future? So that's really our, our approach in San Francisco now. Um, Pascal, you talked a little bit earlier about, um, in your talk, about these, some of these key business drivers um, for ensuring adequate investment in cybersecurity in this sort of smart grid concept. So you, you kind of addressed what some of those drivers are. I was wondering if you had some thoughts on how you, how you quantify or do some sort of cost-benefit analysis, especially sort of as a yard, large utility, sort of thinking about where to make investments or where others might make investments, how you uh, address that. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, that's a tough question. In fact, it's, it's usually very difficult to put figures on cybersecurity. Um, what, we, what we try to, to address here is to, um, to use the risk management techniques and methodology to, to address this question of, of what is a return on investment. So uh, basically what uh, Galen mentioned. Um, uh, I think the, uh, we use different different uh, methods. The first one is to uh, uh, to work together with uh, one person from the let's say the functional aspects of the business aspects, and one person on the more security, cybersecurity uh, type of uh, experience. And uh, when we make uh, those two people work together, usually we achieve to to perform. Uh, uh, a very, uh, very efficient risk management assessment. So that's one of the way we address the problem. Another way is um, to look at uh, what consequences could be could happen, for example, from a failure or from an attack. And usually, what uh, if we uh, if we find some more, something that has a high impact. Usually, it means that we have to put a high attention on these aspects. So even if there is a very a small probability uh, of an attack to happen, if it has a huge consequence, we need to take care of, of these kind of aspects. So uh, well, to answer your question, it's very, very difficult to put real figures, but uh, we, we still have a, the risk management methodology to ensure that our approach is consistent with uh, with our missions and uh, with the threats. Um, Galen, you, um, I, I liked your list of these, the trends impacting mm -hmm. security that, um, that you mentioned. I was wondering if you could um, share a little bit about your thoughts, sort of given the discussion the last two days about sort of mm -hmm. what smart city means. Um, which of those do you think most affect the security challenges for mm -hmm. securing a smart city like uh, infrastructure and environment? Right, I think, I think one of the biggest challenges uh, is going to be having the potential of millions of new devices and sensors that are put out in the field. Even if you have millions, let's say you have 10,000 devices that are put out in the field, uh, for, those, for those devices, you can't 
spend a lot of money on physical protection for those devices. There's a good chance that somebody will be able to reach out and touch touch those devices. So it's not quite uh, the same as, for example, building a large substation, putting a fence around it, and having somebody maybe stationed at a control house, for example, or something like that. Right? You can have, uh, for example, you already have meters on the side of your house. If you look um, on on different poles, a lot of times you can find equipment uh, for do, for your distribution system, and maybe it's in a case, so it isn't a metal case, but it has a little lock on it. And I don't know how you feel about having little locks on on boxes, but they don't make me feel terribly terribly secure. Uh, and if you were to open that up, there's a good chance you would find in there a device with the radio. It could have different COM ports on it, engineering ports on it, debug ports on it, things like that, ways that you can plug in, uh, plug into that system. So, it, and, and to me, that's also what makes this such a unique problem to solve and a departure from the more traditional IT, IT security issues, is that you have this, this uh, problem of physical protection and physical attacks on, on devices. And... To deploy the number of, of sensors and IEDs and actuators that you want to actually make large systems work, uh, there's no way that you can invest uh, a lot of money in those devices. And so the question is, how do, you, how do you architect a system assuming that any particular device will be compromised, right? Uh, so you have to, that has to be your going in assumption when you design that that somebody could compromise a particular device. At some point, you might not be able to trust data coming from that device, uh, for example, or that device might be attempted, uh, somebody might attempt to use that device to attack other other devices or other parts parts of the system. And so I think when you look at at, um, at the smart, at a smart city, um, that I'd say presents one of the bigger challenges. And it, you can't overcome it by doing the good risk management, and instead you can develop architectures that allow any particular device to be, uh, uh, to be attacked or, um, or owned, but uh, it certainly presents a big challenge. Right. Definitely increases the attack surface yes. as you talk to him. Yep. This That's is a whole right. different dimension. <laughs> are there, maybe to follow up on that just quickly, so mm -hmm. John, are there some things, you know, as a municipality, when you're talking about deploying some of these devices within a city or on city property or having to work with, um, you know, deploying them on commercial property. There's some things that can be done to help kind of reduce that, <laughs> minimize that attack surface. I mean, you still have to kind of take into account what Galen said, that they, if, if one of these is is uh, taken over, you've got to account for that. But are, some, are there some things as you were, were thinking about how we would deploy all of these sensors that could be Well, I, I think... To my, my, my fellow panelist's point, one is to build in that security element up front. I mean, a lot of times we rush into deploying things without any really thought to security before we deploy them. It's, it's very easy to buy devices and plug devices in. And I, you know, I, I hate to be the, the, the unenthusiastic person in meetings sometimes, but when I go to these meetings and someone said, hey, we just you know, got a grant for XYZ and we're going to plug all this stuff in, that there hasn't been a whole lot of thought to what does that mean to the system and how is it going to work. And then to, to the second point, I think there has to be acknowledgement that at some point some smart person or persons are going to figure out how to hack the system. And so then I think you're, you're, you always have to have a plan B, so to speak. You have to know when you have been hacked or when the systems have been penetrated. So I think we tend to spend a lot of time and energy in government really hardening the perimeter, but once the perimeter has been pierced, then it's just wide open. Then, then all our defenses are down. We don't really seem to have thought through the you know, second or third level of defense. And so I think building in those uh, requirements or that thought process into how are we going to secure the new things we plug into the vice or when we create these integration points, how are we going to secure that? I think that's the cultural shift I was talking about is just getting people to think about that up front is an important step because I think if you think about that, there are some basic things you can do to make things more secure. Then I think where we're spending a lot more time really is on that second and third layer of defense, where uh, instead of spending all our energy on that first line of defense, we're starting to think about what our fallback positions are and how we can uh, sort of compartmentalize our risk in different areas so that if something is hacked or penetrated, we're going to know when it happened and really minimize the risk to the rest of the system. Okay. Thanks. Um, should we take questions? Okay. If anybody um, in the audience has questions, this, 
microphones. Hi, my name is Olivier. Uh, the CEO of Duke Energy uh, spoke at a conference in Stanford in June. And contrary to what you're presenting, which is cybersecurity is a problem to solve from the growing trend of smart grids, he actually turned things around and said actually uh, cybersecurity is going to be a main driver for smart grids and microgrids. Uh, could you talk about that and whether it's, a, you know, it's too late, the cat is out of the bag and we're going to have hmm. to fix it, or it's a false chicken and egg problem? perspective. <laughs> um, so can you give an example of what you, you know, like, like when you say that cybersecurity is, you know, supposed to be a driver for smart grid in, in Sure. In um, probably last week is a good example. He mm -hmm. was talking about the fact that in a centralized electric system, if you have mm -hmm. a failure, instead of being localized, it could trigger a massive uh, power blackout through a large uh, region. And so it was promoting uh, islands of mac interconnected right. microgrids as a resiliency to uh, cyber security, okay. cyber attacks. I, I see, I see. Um, so you're saying that, uh, right, that the introduction of some smart grid technologies can make the grid more resilient and that that should be a driver for deploying those technologies. And that wouldn't necessarily be just a cyber security attack then, right? It could be from any of these threats. but. But the idea is that uh, you actually are increasing the resiliency of the grid by being able to support things like islanding and, and microgrids. And I, I think that's you're right. That that's an underdiscussed uh, point and, and advantage. I think of of um, deploying technologies like like microgrids, um, for example. And so, but at, at the same time, I'm, I don't think I could flip, use that perspective for all smart grid technologies. But you're right. There are some uh, some key key technologies that can, I, I think, overall increase the um, resiliency of the of the grid. Do you have any comments, Pascal? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I think that that could be useful what you just uh, described, but uh, we still have to uh, to understand that that the power system, like it is right now, is already uh, kind of resilient. I mean, there are all already lots of interconnections, especially in Europe, interconnection on the transmission uh, level. And uh, so we, we are already able to identify uh, where are the errors or the failures on the lines, and we are already able to isolate some, uh, some bad networks in order not to, to have the cascading effect on, on the overall power systems. So we already, I think, have uh, a rather good level of reliability on the electric power network. Uh, probably we can do better. Um, so we are open, of course, to, to any improvement on the reliability. Uh, cyber security and uh, IT, of course, could be of uh, very, very uh, useful technologies to support further, uh, further methodologies or tools. Yeah. Two questions. Um, do you think experts have a, a good idea of how many virus or worm are active today, but not detected? Are we talking about 10% or 90%? I have an idea myself, but I, I would like to hear the experts on that. Really difficult point. Second question is, uh, do you think it's difficult for uh, companies to work on this kind of area when, in the same time, governmental agencies are paying for worm to infect other countries. That something that may be unlawful is supported by state government offices. Paul, from Smart Future, French company. <laughs> oh, okay, I can maybe try to... I will start with the second question. Uh, I think the uh, cyber war, like we call it, uh, uh, is not is not recent. Uh, it starts maybe even even uh, before World War II, but at least during World War II, with the Enigma machines, you know, that were supposed to uh, uh, to cipher the messages sent by the German uh, uh, people uh, to the different field of operation, and. Uh, 
there are lots of of uh, of good work made by uh, UK and US to decipher uh, Enigma machines. And what could be interesting is uh, I prefer to look at the positive way of saying. And wh what is interesting is that uh, uh, historian uh, estimates that uh, the fact of uh, being able to break the Enigma system as, as uh, uh, we have won two years of war during the Second World War. And so I, uh, IT security, uh, uh, I think uh, there is no uh, bad guys against good guys. I mean, it's more complex than, than this kind of, uh, of thing. So, uh, so uh, my point here is, is uh, uh, that IT security could also uh, be useful to, um, to avoid physical war. So, uh, okay, that was my, my first <laughs> answer to, to your second question. Uh, but I will let, of course, my colleagues uh, compliment. And uh, about the, the, your first question, uh, uh, it's very difficult, of course, I will not uh, give a figure, but uh, um, we, are, we are aware that, uh, that some of the system could be, uh, could be infected, uh, even even during the time we just uh, receive them from vendors. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, the right way to address this, this issue is to, to have uh, in-house test beds, in-house resources, in-house or, or shared. I mean, it could be collaborative test bed. It really makes sense. And to be able to uh, assess independently of uh, providers the level of security of the equipment of systems that, that we use. Okay, we'll, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I don't have an answer to your first question either. Uh, I think we'd need McAfee or, or Symantec here at the table to, to give you a, a very definite number on that. Um, and certainly the, their, their new um, forms of malware and viruses have been developed all the time, so that's why blacklisting is actually a losing game in the long in the long run, um, uh, not that whitelisting is that easy in practice either. But um, but you're right. There's I'm sure an incredible amount of malware and zero day exploits that that we don't know about. I don't know what percentage that that is or how you would really estimate that. There. Um, well, the second second question. Uh, it's kind of interesting if you if you think about the amount of money that the utilities invest in security. Uh, and, and the potential threat from, say, a nation-state attack. And I think that's part of why Stuxnet was such an eye-opener uh, for people, because it's clearly very well-funded. Development had gone on for, I think, at least two years. They had taken advantage of multiple zero-day exploits for Windows, as well as um, uh, vulnerabilities in the control system software. They, uh, at, at one point, had um, not one, but two certificates that they had subverted as part of that, that effort as well. And they knew a lot about the system they were attacking down to the number of devices and the vendors, so they had some type of inside, inside knowledge of that or some way of getting inside the, the perimeter of a very physically secure facility. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of operatives involved in that as well in terms of people. Uh, so if somebody actually directs that level of resources at you and you're a utility, uh, there's not much you're going to be able to do, I, I think, because it's cost prohibitive to try and defend against that level of, of attack. So you can work on the low-hanging fruit and hit the medium level and train your people, create a culture of security, have good physical protection um, as well, but uh, that type of focused attack would be very, very difficult for a company to defend against. So I'm curious, uh, you said you had an opinion, what was your opinion? What's your <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more than 50%. One fifty. More than 50%. Because those that are not detected are those that are smarter than the others. <laughs> and that's the main reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the question.
Hi, uh, Bruno with uh, EDF and uh, APRI. Uh, I'd like to, to ask uh, John what he thinks about the, uh, the fact that uh, I assume that uh, you will have one day a, a real attack, a real failure, like the one you already mentioned. And um, are you already prepared to communicate on that? Do you, are you already prepared to say, OK, oh, we are sorry, but we failed in that? And so, you know, because it's also, to me, a question of image. It's not only technical things. It's also, if you fail, for instance, in securing a smart meter, what, what do you want to, you know, to explain to the people that everything would be under control? So, again, are you prepared to communicate and to report to, to the media? I, I, that's a very good question. Because I think, kind of going back to, to some of the, uh, the presentations, I think sort of the change in culture, the change in expectations. <coughs> um, when I look at government, I think a lot of what we're doing in government technology systems today is a direct outcome of what we've all individually already gone through and accepted from a consumer model standpoint, right? And so when I speak at cloud conferences and people ask me, well, why is government going to the cloud now? We're doing open government. I always relate, you know, I, when I started this job 20 some odd years ago, that was unheard of. But we all accepted free Gmail accounts and the end user license that went along with that and online banking and uh, bill paying online. And so I think we all went through this personal transformation of uh, personal technology acceptance and the risks associated with that. And I think we've all formed uh, cultural and personal opinions about when those systems fail, which they always do at some point. There is no system that's perfect, and we've all experienced in our personal lives downtimes of our favorite online service that we wouldn't have wanted to happen, or our credit card company saying that your credit card's been you know, hacked by someone else. I think to your point, the most important thing, and why I, it's not just about open data or cybersecurity, it's about open government, I think it goes back to the confidentiality and the trust piece. I think the public needs to feel like in a smart city, smart government, that there's a confidence that government is doing everything they reasonably can to protect the best interest of the population. But uh, at the same time, uh, the people I meet with, I don't think there's an unrealistic expectation. They think I'm always going to be successful. So what I do think they expect of me is an honest uh, accountability for when we do fail, when we will. I mean, there will be failures of systems, and someday someone, you know, will be successful in penetrating all the level of defense. It'll be a large, embarrassing situation. But to be honest about that and to talk about what we learned from that and how we're going to address that going forward, you know, will, will there be accountability? Will I lose my job? Will, uh, you know, will, will things uh, turn out badly? They might. But... Um, I think that's the journey we're all going through from a cyber standpoint. I mean, you can be a Luddite and say, I'm going to get rid of all my technology. That's the only risk-free approach to cybersecurity, is really to have no technology, to bury all your money in the backyard, to uh, you know, not do anything online, not to have a cell phone, not to have a Comcast Triple Play account like I do. Uh, I assume everyone knows the books I read on Amazon and the movies I watch. I mean, that's my assumption as a consumer, right? I don't really have this false expectation as a consumer that I really have any level of privacy. I, I, I don't mean to be negative because I don't think it is negative. I think when you do a lot of things online and you see some of the examples given, I, I, I'm disappointed at times to find out how much of my personal information and shopping habits has been shared. But every time I swipe my credit card, I assume that's going in a database somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm trusting as a consumer individually that those companies for their own self-preservation interests are doing the best they can, because I'll cancel my account with Amazon or Comcast or Visa if I don't think they're doing a good job. And I think that's sort of the social contract we have in government with the population as we try to be more efficient in using technology to make these smart cities. We do have to be thoughtful about how we build them, because people are going to say, wow, that, that's really like, uh, uh, an obvious thing you should have done to protect the system. <laughs> and I think if we make obvious mistakes, then we should be held accountable for the consequences. But I think if a, if a nation state attack takes down some, uh, a system that we couldn't have anticipated or we were penetrated from within, mm -hmm. um, I think we just need to own that and be open about it and what we learn from that. So have we perfected our approach to that? I don't think so, but San Francisco has gone through a number of uh, highly public, uh, embarrassing security <laughs> incidents <laughs> over the past few years, and I think we've become better at really just sort of owning that and, and having a more... Um, honest dialogue with our with our users and population about what we're doing to make things better. 
So Time for one more question. So Craig. the one thing we do to make people more resilient actually making us more vulnerable? This is a very scary note to end the conference. Can you say something about risk and benefit? Um, is there some method you use to figure out mm -hmm. when the, the risks really outweigh the benefits? Hmm, I don't I think we could ask that question now. So who here thinks they can quantify the value of smart cities? Okay. Uh, so who, who, who thinks they can quantify the risk associated with these technologies? So I, I guess the answer is we don't know. <laughs> At this point. Hmm? Uh, you, you could, I mean, it, uh, you're right, you could go through technology by technology or system by system that you're, right, that you're deploying, but it's, it's still, I think, a difficult, can be a challenging problem to, to still quantify that, and, but, but that's what you would like to know, right, is, is the added value, you know, something I'm willing, uh, am I willing to accept the increased risk for the added value that I'm getting from it, from either operational efficiency, saving money, uh, having a more resilient city, you know, things like that. And um, I, I, I think there's a lot of technologies you can make the case for that, uh, that it would save you money, or you can use in new information that you're getting in, in ways, you, might, you know, change your habits to do things like use less energy or, you know, or um, ways of improving traffic or other, other things like that. Uh, so you're right, you'd have to decompose the question to... We're looking at this particular systems, um, but every time one of those systems is proposed, I, I think you would want to be able to answer that those two questions. Well, I, I think one way to to address your question is uh, first to dissociate, like it, it has already been told, to first to dissociate the critical mm -hmm. systems and other systems. I mean, if you if you want to distribute data about uh, uh, the public transportation. Why not? I mean, there is no, uh, probably not a high risk to, to do such things. Mm -hmm. But when, when you're dealing with uh, critical infrastructures like uh, electricity delivery, uh, water treatment, uh, things like this, uh, probably you need to, to perform uh, a very detailed uh, risk assessment and then uh, assess the threats and then assess the technologies and so on. So. Uh, I think we need to dissociate uh, what kind of, uh, of usage or application of the smart city we're considering. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the first point. And the second point, I think we, uh, we try to uh, also, uh, all of us, uh, propose the fact that uh, we need to design from the start a resilient system, uh, which, means, which means that, like uh, Galen also writes on, on, on his slides, uh, we need to assume from the start that there will be incidents and so we need to, uh, to, uh, to put together a real defense in depth approach, which means a multi-layer. And a layer could be not only technologies, but also people. It could be process, uh, procedures, I mean, and, and so on. Right. I like uh, Pascal says he likes to look at the good side of things. So I'll, I'll go along with that as well and say, yes, you can manage, manage the risk, uh, I, I think, for new technologies. It's not insurmountable. It just needs to be, as Pascal said, part of that design process from the beginning of, of being able to, um, to make sure you have the right protections for, for managing your risk, but also the ability to, to manage incidents when they do occur. So. And, and so I'll, I'll say this from a city standpoint, right? I, I, mm -hmm. I actually, um, I think you just have to go and see things with your eyes open. I think um, technology, um, has, has the, the benefit of making our lives much more uh, luxurious, for lack of a better word, much more convenient, much more efficient, much more effective. I think um, it, it's hard to come up with an example. I, I was sitting here trying to think of the, 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 the perfect storm cyber attack example that took down <laughs> a large city or utility, and I couldn't come up with one, which is good news, right? <laughs> I think we worry about it a lot, but I couldn't come up with it. But we can all think of plenty of natural disasters that um, whether it was you know Hurricane Katrina or uh, the recent you know Hurricane Sandy, 
Um, I was in Tokyo when the big 9.0 earthquake hit. And so if you look at those big natural disasters and the effect they have on the technology infrastructure, that would be the type of effect you'd be worried about, where everything's out of service. The phones don't work, the land mobile radios don't work, the electricity's compromised, the trains aren't running, the water's not drinkable. Um, all those things, that's what you worry about. You worry about someone's going to subvert the technology system and uh, somehow turn that against you. Um, I, I will say, um, having been in Tokyo when that happened, technology is actually what made things better in a disaster scenario. Is that um, even though a lot of the technology was compromised and that people's lives, people were sleeping on the street, you know, they, they couldn't get home and things like that, and that all the technological conveniences that we wanted to use in Tokyo at the time weren't available to us, we still relied on technology, that resilient technology, to make our lives better. You know, we were uh, doing satellite uplinks, telling our families around the world we're okay, we're using Facebook, even though, you know, they kind of messed around with us with Beacon to tell us where we were and how to, how to meet each other and sort of create, you know, uh, sort of micro communities there. Um, we were trying to, you know, uh, interact in that way. And so, even though technology was highly compromised, we still turned back to technology at the end of the day to help solve those problems. So um, I don't think, um, I think certainly there's a risk element to technology, but I think technology has become so embedded in our expectations of how we communicate with each other and how we operate as societies around the world, I don't think um, we should really see technology as the threat that's going to take us down in society. Um, I think certainly pieces of technology are going to be at risk and there's going to be times when they're penetrated. But I think at the end of the day, I think technology is still of a benefit to, to a smarter city initiative, to, to a vibrant um, um, society, and I think it should be supported. <laughs> That's a little more uplifting now. Yeah. Wait in the in the Good session. Way to end. <laughs> okay, I, I think that's it. We're at top. I'd like to everybody thank the panelists.